variations in the internal structure. Now, why do variations exist in the internal structure of the spinal cord at different levels? Like there can be differences between uh, cervical segments of the spinal cord in comparison to thoracic segment, lumbar, sacrum, and coccygeal. Fine. So what are those variations and why are they present? There are some variable factors associated with the spinal cord because of which such variations exist at different levels of the spinal cord. Those factors include the relative amount of gray matter and white matter. That is the amount of gray matter and white matter in proportion to each other as well as in proportion to the amount of gray matter and white matter at different segments of the spinal cord, they can be variable or different uh, in amount from each other. Shape and size of the gray columns, that is the gray dorsal column and anterior column may be of variable sizes in different levels of the spinal cord. And that difference exists because of the mass of the tissue that gray matter has to supply. Let's see at different uh, sections of the spinal cord taken at different levels. Here in the topmost, we have cervical segment. Please note down the difference of the shape of the section of the spinal cord, amount of the gray matter and white matter, shape of the gray matter and white matter. Also, uh, the differences of the extent related to the posterior, median, septum at different levels of the spinal cord, which we just discussed earlier. If you look at the cervical region, spinal cord in the cervical region, is large and oval. Large and oval in shape. Long, slender, posterior, gray horn, and broad and massive anterior horn. Whereas, compare the cervical segment with the thoracic segment. Thoracic segment is small and circular in comparison to cervical, lumbar, and even sacrum. Fine. It is small and circular. There is hardly any posterior median septum present. And we have a much more cylinder posterior horn as compared to present at the cervical segment. What else? Another feature has been added at this level, thoracic level, lateral horn, which was absent in the cervical segment. What else? Look in the size and difference in the shape of the anterior gray horn. We have a cylinder anterior horn at the thoracic segment in comparison to broad and massive anterior horn. Look at the lumbar segment. We have a large circular lumbar segment. In fact, it would not be incorrect to say that after cervical segment, the larger segment is lumbar. Fine. Lumbar segment is large. Cervical was oval. This is almost circular. Look at the extent of the posterior median septum. Here we have a dorsal white commission present between the posterior median septum and the uh, gray commission. We have a bulbous and short posterior horn, whereas again the ventral horn has become bulbous or massive in size and amount uh, but the size is uh, a bit smaller. It has a short. But the uh, size uh, in the width is larger. Mass is more 
as compared to any other segment. What about sacral segment? Small and circular or quadrilateral? It is small and circular. Posterior median septum is complete, so no dorsal white commission. We have massive ovoid posterior horn and a massive ovoid anterior horn. Please note down the difference of the amount of the gray matter in the dorsal and anterior gray columns in comparison to the amount of gray matter present within the, within the dorsal um, gray horn and anterior gray horn of the cervical region. Now, why are these differences present? We established earlier that the, these differences are present or exist because of the uh, area of supply by the gray matter. We know that in the cervical region, this uh, gray matter is going to provide main supply to the limbs. The amount of gray matter is decreasing at the thoracic level. Then further down in the lower lumbar levels and sacral segments, the amount in the gray matter, particularly in the anterior horns or motor horns of the spinal cord has increased. Why? Because the bulk of the tissues that these two horns at these levels going to supply is much more. So most of these lower lumbar and sacral segments, they supply what? Lower limbs. And you know that lower limb muscles, they are more bulkier uh, in um, size and uh, in amount as compared to the upper limb uh, muscles. So, so uh, why are these uh, variations existing? In the gray matter, the gray matter, as you have seen, it is greatest in the cervical and the lumbar regions because it supplies the main bulk of the muscles, which is also located in the upper and lower limbs, particularly in the lower limbs. Whereas white matter actually increases in the amount, white matter increases in the amount from down to upwards, inferior to superior limb. From inferior levels of the spinal cord, white matter, the amount of white matter actually increases superiorly. Why? Because ascending fibers, the sensory fibers carrying sensations from the body, they progressively add up when ascending the spinal cord. Whereas descending fibers, which are usually the motor fibers, they gradually, their number decreases from upward to downward. Because some of their fibers, they keep on, keep on terminating at each segment of the spinal cord. That's why the fibers of the descending tracts, they decrease downward, whereas the ascending fibers or the sensory fibers, they increase while running upwards or going upwards or superiorly. I hope this point is clear. So nuclei in the gray matter. Moving on to the nuclei in gray matter. Here is a diagram. You know that the cell bodies, they lie within the gray matter. This is why uh, these bodies, they give the appearance or color. They impart gray color to the gray matter of the spinal cord. So a collection of these cell bodies is called nucleus. We have groups of nuclei present within the dorsal gray horn of the gray matter. We have different groups of nuclei present at different locations in the ventral horn of the gray matter. And same is the case with the lateral horn. 
I hope this is clear. So what are those nuclei? What are the names of those nuclei present in each of these horns? What are their functions and what are their locations? So first take a look at the names of the nuclei present within the dorsal gray column. Starting from superior most nucleus, we have a postural marginal nucleus. Postural marginal. Next to it, we have here. Here is the postural marginal. This one is the substantia gelatinosa. Next to it, we have nucleus propius. And last but not the least, we have Clark's column, also called dorsal nucleus or nucleus dorsalis. The nuclei present within the ventral horn are named as medial group. Uh, we have medial group of nuclei like this one, fine, and this one. Uh, then we have a phrenic nucleus here in the center of the gray matter anterior horn. Spinal accessory here. Lumbosacral. Lumbosacral is also present among these nuclei, but since its area of supply is not known, so it is not given much of the importance. Then we have la lateral group of nuclei. Lateral group of nuclei. So I hope the names are clear to you. Then in the lateral horn, when present, it has again intermedial lateral and intermedial medial. Intro, medial, and uh, intermedial lateral group of nuclei. Actually, these two groups of nuclei belong to one single group which is called intermediate group. Okay, fine. This is the table showing the names of the nuclei present in the different gray horns, their location or extent in the spinal cord and their functions. So let's see one by one starting with the dorsal gray column. We have superior most near to the uppermost limit of the um, dorsal gray column. We have four stroke marginal. It is present on the entire cord and is related with the pain and temperature as their relay station and also gives rise to spinothalamic tract of the opposite side. These better points they are often asked in the mcqs so you have to study thoroughly for the mcqs and also you need to understand how an mcq can be made substantia gelatinosa is the group of nucleus present just next or down to or below to postro marginal it is also present on the entire cord Acts as relay station for the pain and thermal stimuli. Modifies the sensory input transmission. Then we have third nucleus, nucleus propius, located next to gelatinosa. Also present or extends at the entire cord. Gives rise to ventral spinothalamic tract. Please keep in mind, spinothalamic tracts are ascending tracts or sensory tracts arising from the spinal cord, moving upwards towards the center of the nervous system, that is brain. Then we have nucleus dorsalis, which is also called Clark's column, also called dorsal uh, nucleus. It is usually present at the base of the dorsal gray horn. This at the base of the dorsal gray horn. It gives rise to dorsal spinocerebellar tract, which is again an ascending of sensory tract from the spinal cord to cerebellum. Now let's take a look at the lateral gray column. The lateral gray column 
there is a zone present which is called intermediate zone and it contains intermedio lateral nucleus and intermedio intermedio medial nucleus <clears throat> intermedio lateral nucleus is present at t1 first thoracic segment till upper to lumbar spinal segments why from your previous knowledge of autonomic nervous system in the general anatomy you know that lateral gray column is related with the autonomic nervous system and what are the different levels for the outflow of the autonomic nervous system for the sympathetic nervous system the level of its outflow is thoraco lumbar and for the parasympathetic part of the nervous system its outflow level is sacral more precisely craniosacral because some cranial nerves are also associated with the uh, flow of uh, parasympathetic fibers as well as sacral part of the spinal segment so i hope these two levels of the outflow of sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system is clear to everybody this will also help you memorize the locations and functions of these two nuclei intermedio lateral since it is associated with the sympathetic nervous system what is going to be its level first thoracic uh, spinal segment till upper to lumbar segments thoraco lumbar it gives rise to preganglionic sympathetic motor fibers intermedio medial since it is associated with the parasympathetic part of the autonomic nervous system so its outflow level is going to be sacral s2 to s4 and it is it gives rise to preganglionic parasympathetic motor fibers we shall again study these uh, parts of the autonomic nervous system and these fibers and these levels with the uh, detailed topic of autonomic nervous system in the neuroanatomy next we have ventral gray column it comprises of medial group which is present over the entire cord it is associated with the supply to the trunk of the uh, muscles of the trunk phrenic nucleus phrenic referring to diaphragm it is present at third cervical segment till th fifth cervical segment of the spinal cord related with the muscles of diaphragm then we have spinal accessory nerve nucleus uh it is present at the level of first cervical segment till fifth cervical segment and it is associated with the supply to trapezius muscle and sternocleidomastoid sternocleidomastoid lumbosacral nucleus is present at lower lumbar levels till upper sacral segments and its area of supply is unknown lateral group is present at the levels of third cervical segment till upper second thoracic segment and again present at first lumbar till third sacral segment and since look at the levels of its presence c3 to t2 and first lumbar to s3 where it is going to give its supply it is going to supply the muscles of the limbs upper limb and lower limbs so i hope the location of these groups the extent in the spinal cord and functions is clear to everybody it is uh, an oftenly asked question in the saqs of the university exams now look in, at this diagram especially on the left side of the diagram you can see that we have some roman numbers labeling different parts of the gray matter parts of dorsal column lateral column and anterior column as well as gray commission roman numbering is present from 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 and finally 10 what are these they are called rex lamini rex lamini r e x e d rex lamini 
named after the scientist who discovered these lemini so what is uh, rex lemina these lemini they refer single is lemina plural is lemini with an e at the end these lemini they refer to the layers of the gray matter this scientist named uh, rex he uh, found out these layers of the gray matter or he found out that the gray matter of the spinal cord is arranged in the form of layers on either side fine right and left both sides of the gray matter gray matter of the spinal cord is arranged in the form of layers he found that out in around 1950s and these layers were named after him 1 2 3 4 5 so there are total 10 layers present within the gray matter of the spinal cord you don't have to be nervous about uh, uh, trying to understand these lamina and how these work they are simple layers of the gray matter almost corresponding to the different levels of the nuclei of both anterior and gray column uh anterior horn dorsal horn and lateral horn so lamina 1 is the layer of the gray matter that corresponds to the location of the posterior marginal nucleus 2 corresponds to the location of substantia gelatinosa 3 and 4 nucleus proprius 5 and 6 corresponds to the location or area of a uh, dorsal column which is located near the neck and base of the dorsal horn of gray matter Lamina seven occupies the area of intermediate zone, that is the lateral horn. Uh, lamina eight and nine occupy ventral horn, whereas lamina ten surrounds the central cana. This here. Please pay attention to the layers occupying different areas, which nearly correspond to the nuclei present in the different horns of the gray matter. on both sides so i hope uh, rex lamina is clear to you it is not given in the neuroanatomy by snell uh, but it is a uh, commonly asked question in the university exams so it would be advisable to you that you must go through this lecture repeatedly and take down notes either on your textbooks or on uh, your uh, sticking notes or pages and staple those pages with your textbooks